had gotten three great pieces of advice when I went into this from another guy who was in Washington and he said, Philip, it's going to take three things and just be ready for them. One, it's going to be more expensive than you think to do. Number two, it's going to take longer than you think. And number three, you're going to work harder than you ever dreamed. And he said, if you're willing to do those three things, and, you, know, you have a chance of, of being successful. The brief history of this distillery started, I would say, uh, really about four years ago. I met Mike actually through a mutual friend of ours, a guy named John Regan. John knew at the time I was looking for an investor and also, you know, potentially somebody to help run the company. Well, he said, I have a high energy guy who is trying to do a really unique project. He's trying to take an old ice plant and put a distillery in it. This business to me looked too complex and too regulatory driven to be of any interest to me. But after meeting Phil, his energy, his enthusiasm, and his passion uh, really committed me to the project. Phil had gone out in the interest of building a distillery. He thought, I better find somebody that really knows what they're doing. And he found Dave Pickerel. Dave was a former master distiller at Maker's Mark for 19 years. Dave designed our distillery. And then as it became time for us to actually enter business, we knew one of our challenges was to get a great distiller. We did a national search and found Brendan Wheatley. My name is Brendan Wheatley. I'm the director of production here at St. Augustine Distillery Co. And my job is to oversee the development of all the spirits that are made here and to monitor and track the progress through the aging process and bottling process. Uh, prior to working here, I've been in the industry about 13 years, so total 15. It's the only thing I've ever really done for a living. I've always loved working in fermentation, and I find it really enjoyable. If you need to know what are the components that make good whiskey, you need to drink it. You need to critically smell it. You need to sit in a quiet room with a, a pan and um, very few distractions, and you need to dissect it, and you need to practice dissecting it. Uh, it does require a lot of knowledge to become a distiller, both technical and trained, um, almost like a, we're, we're craftsmen. We're just a high craft, almost, I guess, like a high art. It, it's a very technical skill set that facilitates making alcohol on an elevated level. Last week, uh, we received some great news. The San Francisco International Spirits Competition gave us notice that our gin, which we're really proud of, our New World gin, um, did receive a gold medal. So it was, it was a big deal and great news. I'll give you a brief description of the cocktail culture. What we had prior to prohibition, gin was the dominant spirit, and there were a lot of creative cocktails made with gin. And back then, just because processed food wasn't available, most of these cocktails were made with fresh ingredients. Late 50s, early 60s, vodka became the spirit of choice, and processed food came about. And so if you went into a bar, you had a cocktail that was made with canned juice and soda from a soda gun. And so you had bartenders that had 20 years experience, but we just call them and bartenders, scotch and soda, Jack Daniels and Coke, not very creative. And so in the early 2000s, this cocktail culture emerged where they started uh, making classic cocktails with fresh ingredients. So when we make our cocktails here, we make it with soda water and all the ingredients all come out fresh. So our, our feeling on that, and the feeling really the cocktail culture, is it's better to have one spectacular cocktail than four mediocre gut bombs. When we look at what our um, major agricultural elements in Florida, one of the critical ones for the state, or well-known ones, is the fact that sugar cane's made here. So naturally that's something that we want to work with as a feedstock for our yeast and for our production. So rum is one of the things you can make from that, but another option would be vodka. And so we experimented with making vodka from it and we thought it was unique and atypical and yet really worked well with key cocktails and so why not make it, I guess. Sometimes that's all that matters, it, you know, it, it's, it was there, so it should be made. Prohibition affected our industry tremendously. Prior to Prohibition, there were 3,500 distilleries in the U.S. With a stroke of a pen, they were just gone. A few, very few distilleries survived selling medicinal product. 
effectively what you had was organized crime and the mob, you know, being both the manufacturer and the distribution arm for alcohol. One of the challenges that we didn't realize when we got into this was a prohibition era law called the three-tiered system. You can manufacture liquor, you can distribute liquor, or you can retail it, but you can't do any two. Like many laws had the best of intentions. The intention was so that a single large manufacturer couldn't dominate the small retailers, but that restriction really limited the ability for a small distiller to start and make it economically feasible to run a small distillery. We're still being restricted under 85-year-old laws that say, no, you can't sell to the consumer direct. And so we have worked really hard over the last three years to organize a statewide association that's called the Florida Craft Distillers Guild. We've hired lobbyists and we have engaged our local state representatives and senators to explain to them why we should have the same rights to be able to sell our product as Florida wineries do and Florida breweries do, because that will not only create jobs for us, but it will also help us buy more agriculture from local farmers, it will increase tourism, um, a lot, in our case, allow us to restore a beautiful historic building and many other indirect benefits. We produce a fair amount of alcohol here for a small producer, but it's still a drop in the bucket compared to large producers. For example, many of the large producers will produce close to a million barrels a year of bourbon. We're nowhere near that, and, and I'm, we're okay with that. Uh, we're trying to make something that's a little different, and we will continue to grow. You know, my, my aspirations and hopes and dreams for this company is that it becomes a model for other entrepreneurs. If they put their minds to it, can do anything. And, and for me, this is a second career, and I'm doing it as much to be able to prove to myself that there's still some great business opportunities out there, but also hopefully serve as an example to others that say, if you can create a business that can do both good and also make money, it's a good thing for the community. I feel really proud of what we've done because we've saved an historic building. The oldest commercialized plant in the state of Florida has now been restored. Hopefully it'll be a distillery for maybe the next hundred years.